Hello, and thank you for joining us for this roundtable on state funding of nutrition incentives programs. I'm Nina Budabin McQuown, the GUSNIP Research and Resource Associate at the Farmers Market Coalition. We're so excited to be bringing you a conversation among folks in our field who have successfully sought and won funding in support of nutrition incentives from their state legislatures. Our goal is to help prepare you to engage in policy at the state level and to give you a sense of the breadth of contexts and legislative environments in which programs are gaining the support of their state governments. This conversation was recorded in late February of 2021, so it is pre-recorded and lightly edited for time. We shared a shorter version of this conversation as part of the 2021 NTAE hub convening, so an edited version of the chat for that session is also linked with this resource in the FMC resource library. In that document, you can find a kind of ongoing Q&A from throughout the session. This panel grew out of the work that FMC has done this year with panelists Molly Natoriani, Executive Director of the Farmers Market Fund, and Elizabeth Borst, Executive Director of Virginia Community Food Co Connections and co-lead of Virginia Fresh Match. Molly and Elizabeth are the two authors of an upcoming practitioner paper with FMC that focuses on their 2019 campaigns to pass legislation in Oregon and Virginia, respectively. They're joined by Adrian Udarby, Executive Director of Pinnacle Prevention, who has successfully campaigned for funding in Arizona, and by Alex Canepa of Fair Food Network, who provides policy support to SNAP incentive programs across the country as part of Fair Food Network's technical assistance for the hub. Alex has also worked on state level policy in Michigan and Texas. Finally, we are so glad to have Frank Tamborello, Executive Director of Hunger Action LA here with us to facilitate the second part of today's conversation, which focuses on collaborations across aligned agencies as an essential factor in successful state policy advocacy. Frank is a longtime collaborator with farmers, markets, and nutrition incentive programs in California, where he helped develop the Market Match program. In the pre-recorded session you're about to hear, or see, <laughs> we'll start with panelists' introductions, beginning with Alex, who will give you an overview of the place of state funding and capacity building for nutrition incentives programs. Once everyone has had a chance to introduce themselves, we'll, we'll hand the conversation over to Frank, who will take it from there, and we'll finally head into a more open discussion in the last 10 minutes or so of the talk. All right. Without further ado, thanks so much for joining us and let's get started. All right, my journey with SNAP and Center programs actually began at the Farmers Market Coalition where um, right after grad school, I had the benefit of coming up through the Ben Feldman, Darlene Walnick and Gus Schumacher coaching tree. Uh, and it was a really exciting and heady time to be doing this work because it was in the lead up to the 2018 Farm Bill, which uh, more than doubled the federal appropriation um, for SNAP incentives and renamed the program after the late Gus Schumacher. Um, after uh, leaving to sort of go back home to, to where I'm from in Texas, um, I started working for a nonprofit there called the Sustainable Food Center. Um, and we began the work there of building the, the groundwork for state funding for SNAP incentive programs in Texas. Having done the work and then switching to doing it in Texas and then now uh, in Michigan, what's really impressed me is just how different the approaches are that each state is taking. And at first it seemed overwhelming and that there wasn't really a master plan. And that's the point that I think I've, I've come to, to realize is that there isn't an overarching master plan for SNAP incentives. And I know this is a, a kind of a, a, a tired phrase, but states are the laboratories of democracy and what SNAP incentives should look like in each state is hugely contingent on what are, in my mind, three real different variables. What's the nature of food insecurity in a state? Is it an urban state? Is it a rural state? Is it a state where food insecurity manifests itself primarily among seniors, children, working adults? Um, then there's also what are the facts on the ground for the fruit and vegetable industries in a various state? Um, is it a fruit and vegetable state to begin with? Um, one of the things that we encounter doing this work in Texas was just how challenging the production side of of producing fruits and vegetables in Texas is vis-a-vis -vis a state like uh, Michigan and California where there are vibrant producer organizations, you know, whether they're organized around a particular commodity like asparagus or blueberries or tomatoes. And then finally, what's the different political culture in a state? Um, and I think that we can get hung up with partisan caricatures of each state, but each state has its own political culture that's inescapable and that dictates how a state will approach funding these programs. Um, so in Texas, we were starting from the position of deep skepticism about why is it that a state should be involved in this program. It's not a federal mandate, it's optional. Um, and it started building the case from the ground up that this is an opportunity to draw down federal money 
and if with state buy-in, have the state direct what flavor uh, of a SNAP incentive program. You know, is it going to be focused in farmers markets and focused on helping smaller producers, maybe young producers who sell directly to consumers? Um, and we were really focused on that because the, the organization where I was working ran farmers markets directly. And um, as, as Texas tries to rebuild its, its uh, uh, fruit and vegetable industry after um, some of the challenges that NAFTA posed and has posed for the last few decades, the real interest there was how can we get this as a source of federal funding to increase revenue for direct marketing farmers. Um, for personal reasons, I recently moved to Michigan and uh, uh, started working at the Fair Food Network. And the realities in Michigan couldn't be more different from Texas. Um, our state legislature has appropriated money to fund these programs for, for years. Uh, and because we have received a large GUSNIP grant, um, we were able to expand to grocery stores, which is something that when we were doing this work in Texas seemed like it was years off, um, which our exciting news in, in Texas is that actually uh, GUSNIP funded work is going to grocery stores. Um, and so in, in Michigan, the situation is quite different where the legislature has been aware of these programs for years. Um, and they understand, and there's, there's less of an education component um, in terms of understanding why these programs are important. And it's more helping legislators and state agencies understand just how big and how impactful these programs could be in five years and 10 years. Um, and that has led me to the realization that despite states being different, the one thing that they share is a desire to support poor people and to support people who produce fruits and vegetables. And if this is a tool that states can have in their toolbox to draw down federal money, that has the ability to then amplify the billions and billions of dollars that are spent annually on SNAP incentives. And because we are not a country that restricts tremendously what um, SNAP benefits can be spent on, if we really do wanna encourage people to eat healthful food, particularly locally produced healthful food, there has to be an incentive. Um, states are limited in their ability to, they can't print money. States don't have treasury departments that are, you know, capable of monetary policy. So they have to draw down federal money to do this. And state legislatures have to start thinking about participating in GUSNIP funded programs as like an ante, that you have to pony up some money if you're going to have a seat at the table and really be able to direct how this work is done in your state. And that buy-in from state legislatures is incredibly important and has to be ongoing. That this isn't a, we're going to bounce from one grant to another and then hope that the state appropriates money for each grant. It's the, the next phase of this work, in my opinion, is uh, really impressing on state legislators that this is an ongoing commitment that has to be done and renewed every year or every other year if you're a biennial legislature to make this, these programs happen. It's not just a fly-by-night exciting grant opportunity that you get and then forget about. Um, that if we are going to really ensconce SNAP incentives into the overall work of the SNAP program, as with the SNAP program, states have to make an ongoing commitment. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, we'll pass it to Molly next. Thank you so much, Alex. I love that big picture setting and I think that uh, it yeah, connects to a lot of the things that I'm going to say. So my name is Molly Notariani. I'm the executive director at Farmers Market Fund. We're based in Portland, but we work across the whole state of Oregon. And um, I too actually come at this with a connection from Fair Food Network. So I spent many years managing farmers markets and actually was managing the Ann Arbor Farmers Market when uh, Double Up Food Books was first coming on the scene like 10 years ago. So I've enjoyed seeing the big process. Um, but back to Farmers Market Fund and my work there. Um, it was founded in 2009 as an appendage of the Portland Farmers Market Organization when nutrition incentives were just starting to come on the scene. Uh, and then in 2012, we were incorporated as a 501c3 to really do fundraising to support just that one organization's nutrition incentive programs. In the early years, there were farmers markets uh, in the metro, Portland metro area who were running their own you know, independent nutrition incentive programs. And so we started to kind of convene this loose group to share best practices and talk about shared fundraising. So when the first Feeney grant uh, became available, we jumped on board and applied for it. Um, and interestingly, I know that we're gonna be talking more about uh, coalitions and collaborations, but the same group of key partners that were on our initial Feeney grant continues to be the group that we work with today, um, which is pretty interesting. So we got that Finney grant, 
We scaled up massively. Um, we brought Double Up Food Bucks to the state for the first time and started working, uh, you know, in about half the counties in this state. Um, and it was really successful. But Farmers Market Fund was and continues to be a very, very lean organization. We have like 1.5 FTE. And so we didn't and don't have this massive development team. I mean, the, the Finney funding was really our main strategy, especially for this statewide farmers market program that we had just scaled up. Um, and the work felt really nascent at that time. We hadn't really considered what fundraising would be like. And so when we found out that a lot of our funders who had initially provided the one-to-one -one matching funds for that Finney grant had kind of shifted their priority and we couldn't get the match together, we weren't really sure what to do. Um, we explored and we explored. We tried to, um, you know, keep the program going as best we could, providing support, especially to like the rural markets that had less capacity. Um, but we were kind of at the end of the road funding wise, and that was what brought us to state funding. Um, so I'm gonna stop for a minute and give a little bit of perspective on the legislature in Oregon. Oregon has a biennium legislature. So we have a long session, multiple months, one year and then the next year a shorter session that's just kind of like budget fixes. Um, generally, Oregon is a blue state that probably surprises no one, but the rural areas are very red and we have had a democratic governor for a really long time. Um, in 2018, after the elections, we ended up with a veto proof uh, democratic supermajority in both the House and the Senate, which even for Oregon was a pretty unique situation. Um, one of our main partners has been and continues to be the Oregon Food Bank, who, if you don't know about them, is a very rad food bank. They do a ton of amazing work and actually have like a fully staffed advocacy department that works at both the state and the federal level. Um, so they have always been an amazing and really knowledgeable partner in that way. And while um, Farmers Market Fund had considered seeking state funding in 2017, um, the advocates from Oregon Food Bank said like, don't do it. There's a very dire revenue forecast. Like this is not the time. Um, and at the end of that, the state's farm direct nutrition program got like a million and a half dollars out of the air. And so they're like, why didn't we try to get money from the state? Clearly there is a desire. And if we don't ask, we're not gonna get any money. So it was like this perfect storm of um, needing to figure out a way to, to fund Double Up Food Bucks, not feeling like we could get the match to get another, you know, Finney or Gus Nip grant. And um, we also had this amazing support from Oregon Food Bank who had an advocacy department and a lot of expertise. Um, as we started looking into this, we also forged a relationship with the American Heart Association, who I know that a lot of the panelists have also worked with. Initially, we thought we were gonna get a Voices for Healthy Kids grant to pay for our campaign, um, which ended up not happening. But AHA's lobbyist was really excited about Double Up Food Bucks, took it on pro bono, and continues to be a key lobbyist. So, um, you know, as we were putting our, our bill together, we framed it not just as a revival of our farmer's market program, we also had a CSA program, but also adding on grocery for the first time. So we have this unique model where we sub award to different organizations that do uh, double up food books at CSA and grocery. Um, and yeah, we were also part of, we are and continue to be part of a, a statewide coalition of food system organizations called the Oregon Community Food System Network. And so it was just like this arbitrary, um, you know, member of that organization in down in Southern Oregon who got our first, uh, you know, chief co-sponsor. And from there, we are up and running. Um, because we had lobbyists with decades of expertise in the Capitol working on our campaign, it was somewhat complex. We were um, bringing this idea to the legislature for the first time. And so we were really trying to build buzz and excitement. And we had, you know, dual bills in the House and Senate and, you know, had all of these hearings, even though we had a feeling and what ended up happening was that we would get funding, uh, one-time line item funding and what they call the Christmas tree bill, which is like our end of session omnibus bill. Um, we were really lucky because of all of the coalition building work that we had done um, you know, over the past five to 10 years that we were included in a lot of lobby days for different partners. So AHA, the food bank and like a um, kind of small sustainable farmer advocacy group. So there's just a lot of energy about our bill. And I think that having this kind of a complex campaign kept us going through a lot of the hurdles that we met with. Um, you know, Adrian has, uh, <laughs> who's on this panel, was such an amazing uh, supporter for me when I was getting started, offered a ton of advice. And I remember her telling me just about like, 
crazy thing that happened after crazy thing in her campaign and to be prepared for the unexpected. And we definitely had a couple of those hoops that we jumped through too. Um, it was a cliffhanger, but we did end up receiving 1.5 million in one-time funds. Uh, like in the final days of the legislature, there was a Republican walkout, et cetera. Um, and with, with that funding, I mean, it has been ultimately a success. We built a lot of new partnerships. We've got money. Um, we were able to use that state funding to leverage a GUSNIP grant. Um, and that feels great. I think that at the same time, it's uh, it's one-time funding, you know, it would be, ideal to get line item funding in the agency's budget. And we're kind of moving forward with that. We're in the middle of the legislature right now um, and kind of continuing to build new coalitions that will help um, solve some of the gaps of our last campaign. So we actually have convened like a virtual um, food advocate lobby table that meets remotely. And um, yeah, I think I will stop there and, and be ready to dig into more details and questions. Thank you so much, Molly. Excited for the twists and turns in Adrian's <laughs> campaign story. I'll hand it over to you, Adrian. Thank you so much. Um, I love hearing the stories from Molly and from Alex, and I so much uh, resonates in terms of similarities. Um, and then also there's so many unique factors that come into play with each day as well, too. Uh, so my name is Adrian Udarby. I am the executive director with Pinnacle Prevention. And uh, we have been operating nutrition incentive programs here in Arizona since 2016. We started in 2016 with uh, a FINNI grant, uh, now GUSNIP, formerly called FINNI. And when we started in 2016, we started with eight farmers market sites. And from there, in less than five years to date now, we have over 75 sites across the state across uh, farm stands, farmers markets, CSAs, farmer cooperatives, mobile markets, corner stores, and then grocery, uh, which is currently on hold. And I can speak a little bit more about that here in a minute. But that rapid growth in less than five years really uh, spoke to the need of identifying additional funding to support our efforts. Uh, to the point of, you know, knowing that we wanted to position ourselves competitively for those federal dollars and be able to pull down more federal dollars and knowing that there was the match component. Um, we certainly have great local partners that were providing that private match, but it was our local partners that were saying, hey, we want the state to have a little bit of the skin in the game in this as well, too. We want to see their investment as well in this effort, too. And so it was that effort and um, trying to project our expansion needs that led us to pursue state funding. So our first pursuit of state funding actually started in 2018. Um, at that time, we were advocating for a one-time appropriation. Um, our original ask for that was a million that ended up getting negotiated down to 400,000. And I would love to say that there was logic and reasoning behind that dollar amount, uh, but there wasn't. We were just told, here's the magic number that you need to be at if, if you want to get funding. And so we were happy to take that. Um, and so when we were trying to think about, you know, what does this look like and what does the framing of all of this look like? In 2018, this was happening within the context of um, being a trifecta GOP majority party controlled House, Senate and Governor's Office. And despite what most people think, we still hold that today within our state legislature. And I'll speak more about that here in a minute. Um, but with that, the first thing that we were told by many of our partners when we were looking to pursue this in 2018 was there is no way um, the Arizona legislature will ever fund anything that is remotely associated with SNAP in any way. Um, and so we were going into this, you know, thinking, oh, this is going to be a really hard ask. But I have to say, we ended up very pleasantly surprised at the response that we were getting from folks what became clear to us very quickly was that this is seen as a bipartisan issue. So it didn't matter what side of the aisle that they were on, folks understood this. And for some folks, what resonated to them was supporting local farmers. I think a really key aspect of our ask is that these dollars are supporting Arizona grown produce. Um, and so that was easy for folks to buy into. And you know, for others, it might be the food insecurity issues as well. So no matter where their values were, 
you know, folks could find a way to be able to get behind this. At the time in 2018, we were also up against a, a huge, huge education funding crisis here in Arizona. So when we had to think, well, who would be against this? It's not that necessarily anybody would be against our efforts. It's just that it was one financial ask in the midst of big other financial asks. So it was almost like we were getting pitted against education and food systems and what do we fund? And so our core strategy was really not this or that, but really the and. Yes, we need to fund education, that's important. And those children also need to get fed and those farmers families also need to get fed. And this is what this looks like to kind of paint that picture and that story all together. So our bill was moving along beautifully. Uh, and then at that time we had over 75,000 educators walk out and descend upon the Capitol um, to really demand uh, you know, some strong education funding reform. And we thought that we were going to lose our funding at that point. Uh, we were very fortunate despite that uh, to be able to still see that one-time appropriation make it through that hurdle. And I just share that with, that was our um, understanding that every policy and legislative session will always present a curveball no matter what. There's always something that you can never plan for. Um, so that one-time appropriation in 2018 saw us through for two years. Um, we had tremendous successes because of that. And so then we ended up going back last session, which was in 2020. Our state legislature meets every year beginning in January uh, through April. Oftentimes that gets extended a little bit as well too. And this time we were going back for a permanent funding appropriation request. Again, we went in with a million dollar ask. Uh, we got negotiated down to 500,000. Um, we knew that wasn't going to support our full expansion vision, but we were happy to uh, have that. The bill was moving along beautifully and then COVID hit and our session adjourned very abruptly and we did not see that funding. At that same point, our one-time appropriation funding had expired um, and amid COVID, we were seeing increase in utilization of our nutrition incentive program skyrocket. Um, so what we were able to do was pivot and get some uh, COVID relief state dollars from the governor's office to see us through um, to this next legislative session. And so here we are now in 2021 and our legislative session has just started and we are back with a very strong $1 million per, uh, per year annual permanent recurring appropriation ask. And I have to say the blessing in disguise is amid COVID, um, seeing the increased utilization and seeing the support from the governor's office really created a groundswell of awareness around the importance of nutrition incentive programs. So they did not negotiate us down this time and we were able to come in very strongly at the million dollar ask. Um, and as of today in this 2021 session, while uh, with the recent election at the congressional level, we were able to uh, get two uh, Democratic senators, our state still remained in a GOP majority control trifecta. Um, and while we still had a lot of awareness about the program, um, we did still face a lot of increased polarization as well that we were up against and some new education that we needed to offer to some new folks about the value and the importance of this program. But the bill is moving along beautifully. Um, really, really strong support. We have strong support from the governor's office and we're feeling pretty confident that it's gonna make it through this session. I have to say that all of this would not have been possible over these years if we didn't know that we were in it for the long game. Um, so this has been three long years of hard work and support and it's been made possible through our collaborations with partners. As Molly mentioned, the Heart Association has been a tremendous partner throughout in all of this. We have been recipients of the Voices for Healthy Kids funding and finished land grant funding to help move this along, which has been critical. And then as well as our partnership with the Arizona Food Bank Network, which we'll be speaking a little bit more here about in a little bit. And of course, we couldn't have done any of this without our farmers and our outlet managers and supporters that have come in and spoke in uh, committee meetings time and time again. And I think my favorite part of this entire journey is just to be able to watch the faces of our state legislators as they're hearing from farmers market managers speak in committee or farmers speak in committee um, or corner store managers speak and say, this is what the program does for us, you know, from an economic standpoint, health standpoint, well-being standpoint. Um, and you see their face and soften when they hear those stories. So there's a lot of power in storytelling and for them to hear from their constituents and we're really excited to see what the future will bring. Thank you so much, Adrian. And uh, we'll pass it on to Elizabeth. 
Hi, I'm Elizabeth Borst. It's great to be here with you all today and I'm loving hearing all these success stories. I'm with Virginia Community Food Connections. We're a regional food access nonprofit that operates SNAP match programs in central Virginia um, in the Fredericksburg region. We work with about seven farmers markets directly and they represent about 40% of the SNAP sales um, at Virginia farmers markets. So it's really what we specialize in. I'm also a co-lead of the Virginia Fresh Match statewide network um, along with a partner organization in Roanoke called LEAP. Um, I've personally been working in nutrition incentives since about 2009 and developed one of the first programs in Virginia at a large suburban market and then started expanding out to other rural and urban markets in our area. At the same time, other groups in Virginia were also building out their market SNAP programs um, and forming small regional networks. Uh, ultimately, we joined forces to facilitate the expansion of SNAP incentives through resource sharing and capacity building. Um, and ultimately the development of a statewide network. Um, in 2018, then we applied for um, our own Virginia Fresh Match Finney grant, and we're starting that, we're in our final year of that this upcoming season. We work with about 75 farmers markets currently and four neighborhood grocery stores. We have a hub and spoke model. Virginia is a big state, so we work with regional partners throughout the state that, um, that work with local outlets, um, you know, focusing on kind of providing some of that centralized statewide support at the network level and then regional leadership and local control. So midway through our Finney grant period, we started really thinking hard about sustainability um, and how we were going to continue our, our, our journey on the incentive programs. Um, we started focusing our efforts on building um, state support for nutrition incentive funding. And we were pretty naive going into the process, I will say that. Um, we did get some good advice from others, but I think it's one of these things that you, you really, it's very much experiential learning, right? Um, we had, there was a good statewide focus at that point on child food insecurity, and we were able to work around that um, with our a supportive Democratic governor and, and agency um, partners. They had formed a children's cabinet to look at uh, child food insecurity. And, and as part of that, we were able to connect with a lot of, of state stakeholders that had been more difficult for us to find alignment with. Um, so there was an existing grocery investment coalition that had been around for a number of years. And we started working with that group, which was led by the American Heart Association and the Virginia Poverty Law Center. They had been focused on um, providing uh, investment funding for basically building new grocery stores in low resource areas and kind of in the process of working with them, we were able to, you know, share experience that, you know, small farmers markets can become major food hubs if they have the right capacity. So um, that that kind of got integrated more into into that approach and um, collectively we, we also we were advocating uh, to, for legislation to support you know, innovative retail kind of from their perspective, but it, it SNAP incentives from, from our perspective. Um, so in 2020, a bill was passed that created a new fund in Virginia called the Virginia Food Access Investment Program and Fund. It uh, asked for 6 million in funding, ended up with 1.8 in seed funding. Um, and that became a new grant program through the Department of Agriculture. Um, they used a, a pretty interesting and, and new approach called equitable food oriented development, which some of you might be familiar with, and that um, was designed to support community based retail projects in underserved communities and particularly focused on um, BIPOC led initiatives. So the Virginia Food Access Investment Program and Fund requires that projects accept SNAP or I'm sorry, yes, accept SNAP and offer Virginia Fresh Match incentives but there was no direct funding for Virginia Fresh Match within um, this grant fund. So it, it le leave, left us and still leaves us in an interesting position of, you know, kind of having this, um, this mandate, but not any direct support to continue that. So um, the General Assembly is in session right now, and it's currently uh, considering a request for an additional 2 million in, in funding for this um, grant fund. However, there is still no direct funding for nutrition incentives, um, state supported nutrition incentives, I should say. So to extend the runway for the incentives that we're currently providing to, to our partners, um, we are applying for uh, another a new GUSNIP, uh, which we're working on as we speak. So, you know, we, we've learned a lot in this process. Uh, there's certainly a lot to know um, and I, I appreciate what what the others have said about the sort of unique nature of individual legislators and 
you know, what it takes to work through these different coalitions to reach your own goals. Another aspect of our program was that we are a series of small nonprofits working together. We do not have a big statewide structure. And I think that that has, has led to some interesting challenges. We, while we were going through this, this whole journey, you know, we were looking for who's this big statewide partner who's gonna take on this work, you know? Um, where, where's our long-term home? And, and in fact, we're continuing to be just small nonprofits working together to, to do this work. So, you know, you, you, you don't always end up where you think. And, and I do think it's, a, it's, it's really important, as others have said, to look at this as, to look at the long game. Um, perhaps in, in another three years, uh, you know, when we're coming to the end of our, of our next um, GUSNIP, should we be successful at getting it, you know, we, we may be in a different position. And I, I really appreciate hearing from the others, especially about their strong partnerships with um, their food bank networks. And I think that that is a, always a, a piece that we have to try and, and figure out of how does the retail food world work with the emergency food world? And you know, what are those kinds of, um, of coalitions that can, can really move this stuff forward? I feel like this is absolutely the moment for nutrition incentives. You know, if there was ever a time to show its value, I mean, all of us had asked, you know, an enormous growth last year, um, yet, the money goes to emergency food. So I, I believe that that is something as a, as a community, we have to, to figure out a way to, um, to connect these dots and, and show people how nutrition incentives kind of come right next to emergency food. And you want, you want to give that opportunity to people to choose their own, to buy culturally appropriate food, to learn how to, you know, how, how to do this and not just, just receive a box um, of somebody else's choosing. So um, we're still very much um, on the path and, and excited about um, learning from others. That, that's been a, a key part of, I think, all of our work is, is this network um, and, and the support that it provides uh, just in terms of how we continue to, to learn. And for the focus on partnerships, we're gonna shift the conversation to Frank Tamborello, who's gonna introduce himself now and, uh, and then uh, lead a discussion for us on this statewide coalition building and partnerships that you've all been talking about. Thank you, Frank. All right, thank you, Nina. And uh, it's really been inspiring to hear all of you uh, talk about this and interesting to collect all the different messages that you've used to get this uh, you know, successfully across the, the finish line. Uh, I'm gonna give you a brief background of Hunger Action LA, and then I'm going to uh, ask you some, some questions to delve a little more into some of the things you've already discussed. So Hunger Action LA was formed in uh, 2007, and basically as a, a small grassroots policy advocacy group. Um, and my background was in a wide variety of anti-poverty programs, including homelessness, uh, cash assistance, and things like that. So you know, it, it's it's been a path of growth for me to get into the the field of uh, food. Um, in the early days of, of Hunger Action LA, we did start the first SNAP incentive program in the city of, of Los Angeles. And there were only eight at the time, what we now call market match uh, organizations in California. And thanks to the hard work of the Ecology Center, we're now a coalition with, I think, somewhere between 40 and 50 groups and nearly 300 farmers markets offering market match across the state. And as many of you did, uh, during COVID, during the pandemic, you've seen like a huge increase. We had like a 50% increase in the distribution of SNAP incentives. A few years ago, um, our big coalition was successful in getting some state funding, and that was to match a, a large uh, GUSNIP grant that we were getting into the state. And we're going to be pushing for that again uh, this year. And uh, we're also now starting, uh, Hunger Action LA is starting to work with the Heart Association through Voices for Healthy Kids. And uh, we're going to be working on other uh, structural supports for uh, not just market match, but expanding into grocery stores and other locations as well. So um, in hearing all your stories, I know you've had different challenges. Uh, the, the biggest challenges to me seem to be the, the uh, getting the bipartisan support, but also in working with a coalition to help uh, get across the finish line. And so, Alex, I know that uh, the Sustainable Food Coalition worked to get a bill across that uh, that was going to study further implementation of SNAP incentives in uh, Texas, right? When you spoke to the legislators, did you encounter any opposition that was purely ideological and that that wasn't just a, hey, we don't have the money, but it's like, we just don't really don't like this idea? Um, it was less opposition to SNAP incentives specifically and more frequently 
politicians love to hear themselves talk and they like to talk about the thing that interests them, even if it's not what you want to talk about. So frequently it would be, the conversation would be drug in a different direction and it's your job to repivot them and refocus them. So um, when we were testifying, one of the um, uh, legislators really wanted to know why we couldn't restrict SNAP, why, it, why our organization wasn't working to make it so that you couldn't buy Coca-Cola with SNAP. And so just being able to kind of quickly parry and redirect the conversation saying, that's a decision that's made at federal level. It's a political third rail. Can I tell you about the thing that I wanted to talk to you about? So in my experience, it's less pointed opposition and more uh, trying to redirect the conversation. And uh, it's your job as an advocate to not let that happen. And then an, another question about that advocacy in Texas, um, you worked, I think, with the Farmers and Ranchers Freedom uh, Coalition. Were, were they helpful in bridging some of the, the partisan divide? Absolutely. So we, we, we worked with, we had a, a suite of three bills, all of which were successful in the last Texas legislature, two um, reduced uh, occupational licensing and some of the regulatory burdens that small direct marketing farmers face bringing their products to market. And then the other bill was SNAP incentives. It's not just Alex showing up from the hippy dippy nonprofit in Austin trying to get more money for food stamps. It's sometimes Alex wants to talk to you about food stamps and sometimes he wants to talk about government overreach. <laughs> and so if if you can really drive home to legislators that that this is a very complex that food systems are complicated and it's not always a left-right binary that, that gets respect, bipartisan respect for your organization. And one thing I will say to reiterate something that Elizabeth said is that I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have a professional lobbyist. Um, there's a I, there's a turn of phrase that I've heard is, is funnier in Korean, but if you want fish, go to the fish market. If you need one very specific thing done, go to the expert that is really, really, really good at that. Even if you're from a state and even if you follow that state's politics closely, you may still not be the best person to be the advocate for this issue. And it's really tempting to try to do it yourself. And in my experience, even being around policy, we couldn't have passed that bill without the American Heart Association. And in Michigan, even though we're a politically involved organization, we still have a private lobbyist on retainer who can do things and see things that I can't see because he's got two decades worth of experience. And in my experience, state legislatures are kind of idiosyncratic insular environments frequently that have their own words that, that nobody else understands. And I think that private lobbyists, there's there's a lot of social sort of stigma about that, but it's really, I think that as a field, we should try to move away from that. And, and something that I've also found is that if you are working with a diverse coalition of community-based nonprofits, there's nothing that can kneecap an advocacy campaign more than being perceived by the legislature or the executive as being disorganized and that there is internal division among your coalition. That is not a good look. And I think that it's actually very good for focusing and refining your ask to, to if you've got a professional lobbyist or even someone like you know the AHA's lobbyist, that if you can reach internal programmatic agreement on money stuff, on program stuff within your coalition, then you can go to that lobbyist and say, okay, we've spoken amongst ourselves, this is what we want. And they say, great, now this is what I need from you. And this is what I'm gonna do with this information moving forward, as opposed to, and sometimes they don't wanna know what the coalition dynamics are. They're kind of like, spare me the drama, just tell me yeah. what you want. And that can actually be a really useful focusing exercise I find in these legislative campaigns. Well, that's some, uh, that's some really powerful advice. And I, I think you hit on a good point. The professional lobbyists, they're hearing stuff around the halls of these state capitals that you know none of us are gonna have access to. So they've, they've got other things swirling around that's gonna influence how they uh, make their move. And Molly, in Oregon, kind of the same question. Uh, did you find there were some groups that were really instrumental in being part of your coalition that maybe you wouldn't work with normally as much, but they really helped in this particular campaign? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I think, um, hmm, you know, early on, we definitely went after the Farm Bureau first. Um, I think that you know, in, in Oregon, well, a couple of things. One is that we had bipartisan support as our um, chief co-sponsors of the bill. We sought that out early and that felt very important. 
Um, we also added the Farm Bureau as an endorser before we added Friends of Family Farmers, which is kind of like the sustainable anti-Farm Bureau group. Um, that was some advice that uh, a lobbyist friend gave me, like, wait until the very end to add Friends of Family Farmers to, <laughs> to your group. Yeah, so um, <laughs> perfect. We won't <laughs> make anyone upset. Um, I think, yeah. Um, I don't feel like, you know, the they're kind of these like concentric circles of how engaged people are in the campaign. And we struggled with that, I think, in the first year because we wanted to draw a really wide net and get everyone to be involved. And then there is kind of this like hurry up and wait often where we're like, all right, is this the time that we're going to like mobilize the troops? Do we need everyone to reach out to their legislators? Like, no, no, this is just the hearing. Um, so there, yeah, there is these concentric groups of like our active campaign, you know, the, the small group of organizations that were in the Capitol, the next larger campaign that were farmers markets and like regional food system organizations that, you know, maybe would send a, a letter at the, you know, out and out and out. Um, so I think the groups that were actively doing the work were not unusual. I, something that Alex said made me think of like a really good piece of advice that I got from a, um, a partner like early on before we had even started. And he said, you know, I've seen this happen all the time. Um, what you guys need to do is talk about what will happen within your coalition if you don't get all the money. Um, we had originally asked for $2 million and then early on the bill got modified and someone was like, that's not enough. Like, they're not gonna take you seriously. Like, just bump it up to three. So <laughs> bumped it up to three, you know, didn't have a budget, didn't really know what we were gonna do with it. Um, but early on we had a conversation about like, all right, we're gonna fully fund farmers markets we'll fully fund CSA and then we'll slash grocery if we don't get all the money. And so at the end, when we got half of what we asked for, we were delighted and also so much pressure was relieved because we kind of already, we didn't have to do those negotiations, so. And, and just quickly to add on to that, because you know, the grocery and CSA angle for a lot of us working with farmers markets, yeah, well, there's a little bit of, of tension there. Was was there some tension or a little bit of debate about how to split up any anything you possibly won? Um, that's interesting. I mean, I think because the farmer's market was like the most, the longest existing program and because me as a farmer's market fund was kind of leading the campaign, that was a given. I think, um, the food bank was coordinating the grocery program and they were a large capacity organization, but they weren't going to be able to do it if they didn't get the FTE that was coming from the state money. So that felt simple. Um, I think that, you know, talking about strategy, we were really, um, it felt like a, a good narrative that, you know, X amount of farmers markets, you know, 55 farmers markets in 18 Oregon counties. And in the communities that don't have farmers markets, the grocery stores are gonna be filling in. Um, so that felt like a really nice patchwork to be able to kind of reach people everywhere. All right, thank you. Um, so Adrian, I noticed in your coalition with, uh, with Pinnacle, um, well, I know that Pinnacle has worked with a lot of health uh, agencies, um, is including county health departments in certain areas. Uh, how instrumental were they in the, in your uh, campaign in Arizona? Yeah, so I think our health partners have been on board with us from the beginning. One of our largest cash match partners happens to be um, a health plan. And so they sent their chief medical officer down to speak in committee when our bill got assigned to health committee. And that was really powerful to know when to pull which actors and players into which committees and how they got assigned. Um, in addition to that, within the health departments, many of those individuals and partners are part of the, our regional uh, food coalitions as well too. And so while they may be in a government role, couldn't take a very active um, lobbying or advocacy platform, they were really good to provide education data and context in that way as well too, um, and could be powerful within those regional coalition efforts as well. Um, I think having cross-sector representation from food banks and from health and from store owners and managers and all of those different pieces was really, really important in terms of knowing who are we speaking to, who's the best person to go in and share their message with them at this time. Thank you. And uh, Elizabeth, you know, you're working with a, a group of nonprofits, a group of small nonprofits, mostly. Um, do you find there's like a learning curve between the ones that are doing the direct food assistance? And I know that uh, during the pandemic, there's just been a lot of, uh, you know, emergency food assistance going on everywhere. But in Virginia, I was reading some about the, the Fredericksburg uh, Food Access uh, Forum. 
Uh, has there been a learning curve about getting the groups that aren't as much into the whole food security picture and, and more into the direct service, but you're able to get their support still somehow? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a tremendous uh, shifting of ground, but, you know, many of us who have traditionally been in sort of the, the retail food space, or, you know, merging more into emergency food and, and vice versa. So I do think there's a, a lot of um, uh, just movement in that. And, and again, that's why I feel so compelled to figure out how to strengthen those relationships. Um, I was reflecting on kind of where some of these, some of our coalition partners were coming from. And, and I think that's been a big lesson for us. You know, you really have to know what, what people's priorities are. And I think we made some assumptions that our priorities were everybody's priorities and that that wasn't the case because, you know, because we tapped into this sort of existing grocery investment fund, that was their mindset. That was where, you know, these were retail, big retail people in, in many cases um, and, and all, you know, dietitians and others who were trying to support the idea of, of innovative retail in these low access areas. Um, but, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't being led by SNAP incentives. So I think that that's a, just kind of, a, again, an important learning point for us that, you know, if, if that's not the primary focus, it's probably not gonna end up being the primary outcome, right? Um, and, and again, well, American Heart Association, it was a, a huge focus for them. They, they wove it into these, these other strands. Um, and because you have to have a, an agency partner in this, you know, the, the, the state doesn't just hand out money to nonprofits, um, it, it really came, came down to meeting the goals that the Department of Agriculture had set for themselves, much more so, you know, in the, in the sort of the, the final way it, it, um, it was implemented. And, you know, again, very, all very positive. We're still tied into the whole thing, but didn't, weren't able to make the case that state-funded state incentives were, were critical to this. Um, and I think it was in part because this long history with the Bursary Investment Fund uh, that was not successful in getting state funding for building grocery stores. So, you know, that maybe kind of washed over us a little bit. Well, why, why should the state pay for this? You guys have federal funding. Yeah, well, it's, it's a circle. <laughs> uh, so we're still, we're still pushing on that path. But yes, I, I, I do think that, that um, trying to figure out, you know, who, who the players are, what their motivations are, um, and, and what they really want out of the deal you know, that was a lesson for us. So in thinking about coalitions and how just important they seem to be in, in, in getting our SNAP incentives legislation uh, passed. Well, Adrian, I wanted to start with you. Aside from the, uh, the different health partnerships that you've developed, are there people from other non-food related fields who've been part of your coalitions to get uh, SNAP incentives policies passed? That's a great question. Um, when I think about it, there's some there's some inevitable tie and connection back to food, I think, for every partner. I mean, other than the health partners that may be more so health driven in association with the health plan and some of those folks, there's still, you know, that health plan is there because they're investing in food systems. They have community reinvestment dollars going back to that. Um, if we have grocer partners, you know, that's still their economic business and tie back to food in that way. And I think honoring that and that food is the connection that binds, you know, and everybody can connect and relate to that and has a story behind that. Legislators who maybe are in, you know, a financial sector or whatever it is that they work in, they still have a connection and a story tied to food. So um, I'd have to say everybody there that was part of it and part of the network and part of the advocacy efforts had a story or a tie back to food in some way. Even I was thinking in your... Uh... In your case where you found there was a big education funding crisis, um, mm -hmm. is there any cross connection between some of the education folks and the, and the food folks and saying, hey, we can work to get both of these together? Absolutely. Uh, from the onset, um, our, the teachers here in Arizona know better than anybody how child food insecurity impacts learning and child health and well-being. We didn't have to convince them, you know, by any means. They are also very closely tied to their school food service directors, and many of those school food service directors are tied into local farm to school efforts. So it does become this smaller world. Um, so we didn't have to convince them, and it, to them it didn't feel like you had to pick this or that. 
um, they were very much on the same page of yes, you need to fund education and you also need to be funding, you know, the feeding of folks in community um, in good, healthy ways. So uh, that was an important aspect. Yeah. Alex, did you all get any uh, surprise alliances in, in Texas in the work with the Sustainable Food Center? No surprise alliances, only welcome alliances. Texas is one of these states where it's really, it's, it's, it's as we are fond of reminding our, our friends in the other 49, it's very big. And uh, what's happening in Dallas and what's happening in Houston and what's happening in Austin and what's happening in San Antonio can seem really, really disparate. Um, so uh, when Sustainable Food Center threw its hat in the ring and said, okay, we've got the bandwidth to kind of run point on trying to get this bill through the legislature. Um, the, you know, our, our friends in, in Houston said, oh, thank God, you know, <laughs> like, let's, let's, let's. <laughs> and I think that it was more of just like a coordinating, not, not issue. It was just that we were all kind of sitting around waiting for someone else to do it. And um, it was just, there's a lot of work that goes into it and just facilitating the calls and, and the follow-up and, and, and things like that. So I, um, no surprise. Well, the one thing I will kind of ca caution people about is when it's clear that your bill's going to win, it's going to get across the finish line, then don't be surprised if other groups start trying to tack on their priorities to, to your bill. And we're all nice and we don't say no very well because mm -hmm. we are who we are. Um, there was an instance towards the end uh, where another nonprofit said, hey, can we just add our little program onto yours? We, uh, I'm so-and-so, by the way. And then we kind of just had to, no, 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 you can't do that. And so I think that's one thing to be, to be conscious of. Um, but in our experience in Texas, it was more just the excitement of, of, of feeling like, you know, okay, maybe this is like, you know, maybe we can, this, this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship <laughs> with all these, yeah. with all these different organizations. Um, and I don't know how much of that is sort of, Texas is sort of idiosyncratic, how disparate it is, but that was our experience. And uh, Elizabeth, uh, anything you would like to add to, to um, what you've been hearing just in the last couple of uh, conversations? Um, some, something that, that Adrian said about, you know, all of these, everybody has their, again, everybody has their own perspective. The, the delegate that sponsored the legislation um, initially, you know, she had a, a personal story about food insecurity in her neighborhood growing up. And I mean, she came back to that again and again and again. And then you realize that this is her motivating factor. And I think, I think it is really important to, to try to understand and tap into what it is about this that resonates. And, you know, she would go off in, in different directions about backyard gardening and different stuff. And you'd be like, okay, but you know, how about this? Uh, so, so sort of what Alex was saying, if you just kind of gotta, gotta keep trying to pull it back to, to the, the initiative at hand, but um, you know, you, you, you have to get your support where it comes from and, and you've gotta be open to, to that, uh, to, to whatever their narrative is. I think. A lot of really great lessons today and a lot of really great examples. Molly, I just wanted to uh, hand it over to you to close up if there's any other comments you'd, you'd like to make after hearing all the discussion. Oh gosh, I don't have any um, final <laughs> remarks prepared. <laughs> um, well, yeah, the final, I, final. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, it, it's such a steep learning curve and it's, you know, I just feel like I have gotten so much support it just is an incredibly steep learning curve. And, you know, I've gotten support from people on this panel. I've gotten support from, you know, Fair Food Network, I've gotten support from people in the state. And so I think um, there's always so much to learn. And that's what's really exciting to me about it. I mean, I think, you know, we're putting the pieces together new every single time and some things are the same and some things are different. Um, and so I, uh, you know, I just love being able to talk about this program. I think that there's something that appeals to everyone, whether it's the agriculture, whether it's the food insecurity. And, um, you know, I've been using the economic development, the like $1.79 figure a lot this year. And I hope someday that we'll have better data from Oregon that can kind of show the actual economic impact. But yeah, I think that it just resonates with so many people and, um, yeah. It's been a fantastic conversation, just a wealth of experience from a diversity of states and uh, a lot of good lessons for people who are going to be undertaking this. So I want to thank everyone for
being on this panel and uh, sharing some of those experiences with us. I'll hand it back to you, Nina. Thank you so much, Frank. And yes, thank you so much, everyone, for fantastic, um, fantastic answers and discussion. Um, before we close up, maybe we can just take 10 minutes if you all have questions for each other, just for a slightly more free form conversation among the panelists. Um, if if you all don't mind, I'll kind of start us off just listening to you all talking um, and thinking about how so many of you have, uh, you know, begun with kind of this first legislative campaign where, you know, maybe you got to part of where you wanted to go and um, and going back to uh, the legislature for a second campaign. I'm wondering what kinds of um, what kinds of impacts and uh, and 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 collection of information did you want to do in the interim period um, as you were thinking about the, sto the story you wanted to come back with uh, for your second round? And, um, and that's for anyone to, to jump in and speak to who feels moved. I'm happy to jump in on this one. Um, you know, we, we felt so disheartened when things came to such an abrupt stop with COVID. And everybody was telling us when you go back for this next round here in this 2021 session, really focus on the COVID impact. And that felt important to us, um, but we also didn't want to give the message that this is just a one-time solution in response to COVID, that this is long-term good policy. So the dance became for us of, yes, this has definitely had an impact with regards to COVID from you know, addressing food insecurity and ensuring job sustainability and viability for farmers, um, you know, circulating dollars back in the local economy. Uh, but also that's good to do long-term as well too. So that messaging has been a little bit of a dance for us. Um, and then also just really, you know, in Arizona, we are also home to 22 sovereign nations and indigenous communities and really ensuring that we were uplifting what this looked like from that cultural lens for them. Um, one of the sites that we had to pause because of lack of funding was our grocery store in Navajo Nation. Um, and so being able to help paint that picture around that has also been really important for us. And we're, we're still navigating that as we go. I would love to hear from others who also have large tribal populations too, if you could speak to that. Sure, so in Michigan, um, our uh, we've, I believe, have 12 federally recognized on the Dawes Rolls tribes that are tribal communities, rather, uh, as opposed to state tribes. And it's been the kick in, it's been the kick in the pants that we needed to make our programming awesome in rural Michigan, because half of the tribe lives off the rest. So if you're going to serve that tribal community, it can't just be good programming on the reservation. It has to be the communities around the reservation. And that is it's hard, you know, getting goods and services to people in rural communities is hard. And I think that that's something that's the biggest challenge that we're gonna be up against in the next three years is how do we stay on budget, make these programs great and get these programs. Cause so most of Michigan's tribal communities are in mid and upper Michigan um, where, you know, it's, it's, it's all of the challenges that you face serving any rural community. Um, and the other kind of thing that I just wanted to throw out there is I admittedly am a young professional and I have only been really paying attention to politics intensely for about a decade, but I've never worked in an environment that feels more like an ideological free for all in which the left, right, Republican, Democrat binary around issues has just totally blown up. Both Democrats and Republicans are more skeptical to free trade than I've ever seen before. And that impacts fruits and vegetables. Um, there is a, a, a pretty sizable block within both major parties that really wants to, to that, that views market concentration among retailers as an existential threat to small business. And I think that if we can really explain in patient and honest ways to both Republicans and Democrats why these programs can help with the, these evident problems that people in Republicans and Democratic circles are talking about, then that's the way to sort of cement these programs and this idea as a post-partisan issue. Um, and I think that that partisanship is, it's, 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 it's making Americans hate one another in, in a way that's unacceptable long-term. But if there's anything that, any good that, that can come from it, my hope is that both Republicans and Democrats seem to be willing to swing for the fences and try new things in a way that I am not accustomed to seeing before. And I think that if we can capitalize on that, 
energy and, and longing for newness in policy planning. Let's let's try to capitalize on that momentum. I am. Um, I think that as far as you know, changes that we had hoped to to bring forward into our work in this upcoming legislature, like unfortunately, 2020 was the first year of our state funding. And so we had all of these lofty dreams of like doing great storytelling, doing a tour, having all of these like legislator visits at participating sites and none of that happened. Um, I, so we didn't really collect any of that great data, but of course then, you know, the need is very clear. Um, I think one area that I see a perpetual room for growth for us is engagement of SNAP participants. You know, we have very few people who are, you know, directly impacted by food insecurity that are active in our advocacy work and that, or, you know, in program design and implementation, that feels like a big problem to me. Um, a problem that emerged in the 2019 legislature that we're working towards solving is better communication amongst the different organizations that are doing kind of food access work in the Capitol. I think that um, it has scaled up quickly. And so there used to just be, be a few people and there wasn't a need for cohesive communication, but um, Oregon has like an amazing, amazing farm to school program, very well funded. And um, in the 2019 legislature, there was kind of like a backroom deal with a elected official where they went from getting like $5 million to $15 million in funding. And it was like, that's great for farm to school, but that was for the person on ways and means, like that was their bucket of food system money. And <laughs> so farm to school felt bad, we felt bad. Um, and so we just, you know, had kind of had informal communication, but there was no mechanism for check-in. And so now we're actually creating like a fact sheet with all of the fiscals for every single, you know, anti-hunger program. There's pie charts. Um, so, I mean, I think that we have a weekly call like that communication both feels, you know, selfishly important, but also really strategic for the big picture of us not being pitted against each other. Like, I can't tell you how many meetings I had where I was like, well, you know, what do you think is more important? Like double food bucks or this? And it's like, no, 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 it's, we need them all. <laughs> We're only asking for several million dollars. So make the pot bigger. I'll just echo what Molly's saying, you know, the integration between these different food system sectors is, I mean, that's really where we're focused in this next round is, is to treat all of these as aligned projects, not competitors and, and not siloed buckets of, of money. Um, you know, we just, I think, I think it's a, I think it's going to be a, a hard, a hard job, um, but I don't see how we can succeed without trying to be really, truly integrated. Don't know exactly what that means yet. I'm working on it. So that was a terrific place to end it. But before we do, I just want to thank all of our panelists, Elizabeth Borst, Molly Toriani, Alex Kanepa, and Adrian Udarby for bringing their wisdom and experience to share with us today so generously. And I want to thank Frank Tamborello so much for facilitating this wonderful conversation and wish all of you um, who participated and all of you who are watching success uh, in your upcoming funding requests should you be planning them. Um, for those watching and listening to this, you can contact the Farmers Market Coalition if you're working on a state funding ask and are interested in being connected to other organizations who are currently working on similar campaigns. You will also be able to find Molly Natoriani and Elizabeth Force paper on their own state funding campaigns available through the FMC Resource Library, the Nutrition Incentive Hub, and the Farm Direct Nutrition Incentive Guide site uh, in the second quarter of 2021. Thanks again for watching and listening to this panel on state funding and nutrition incentives.